नमस्कारम एवरीवन वेलकम टू अनदर एपिसोड In this episode, we'll be discussing uh, this fascinating topic where we'll discuss how XR is reshaping healthcare. And joining us today, we have Oliver. Oliver is a physiotherapist specializing in neurological and MSK cases for five plus years. He's also a certified sound engineer with a passion for tech and programming. He's currently working as a medical XR software developer for Softcase Studios, also as an advisor at Medical XR SI. and co-founder at XRSI Europe so uh, i'll let oliver introduce himself now yeah uh, well i'm i won't take too long on the introduction because it's the least interesting thing but uh, basically my job is mainly as not so much as a sound engineer anymore that's useful background but uh, as mainly as a physiotherapist in uh, neurological and musculoskeletal uh, disorders so you know uh, not one or the other but both uh and um as a software developer and as far as software development there are a few projects one is my work with softcare studios uh and one is a kind of personal uh initiative which is xrehab.org not .be which is something that just suddenly appeared and uh, they decided to take the same name um and uh so that is focused on specifically on creating uh software uh in VR for physiotherapy uh but in general my focus is on uh software for healthcare uh and that's that's me basically so let's now ju- uh, dive into how xr is currently being integrated into healthcare s- sector yeah um so to give a kind of a brief rundown i think you can there are a few main areas right in general in healthcare um so one you know you have things that are to do with medical training and education so you have um for example uh, anatomy visualization so you could have uh, 3d models of the human body and be able to see how things work in in three dimensions uh you could have surgical simulations you could have um remote collaboration between uh, healthcare practitioners uh, so you have this type of area here uh, then you have uh, surgery and uh, diagnosis for example um so here you have um planning and you have you know training for the surgery itself uh, so this is actually something very effective um apparently that there has a very high success rate uh, this type of you know vr used for this specific thing um and then we have pain management which is a big one as well um and then we have mental health and rehabilitation which is a little bit more my area together with pain management um so what do you what would you would you typically use xr for so for the vr part where you're completely immersed you might use it for exposure therapy for fears or uh, stress uh, post traumatic stress disorder uh, anxiety disorders or phobias let's say you're afraid of flying on a plane or something uh, so you recreate the experience that would be um, would, would cause the the fear um then we've got physical rehabilitation which is completely my area and I'll go into that a bit better uh later um and then we have also the social aspect which might be more of a future thing but perhaps you know the idea of allowing people who are uh, constrained to i don't know to a hospital or something they can access uh, social experiences for example so this is the kind of the overview of what um what we have in the industry i would say So uh in your experience how has xr uh, proven to be beneficial in healthcare I think there are a few key points uh I would say that we have the the fact that it somewhat enhances learning and training because you can see things in front of you so for example in the case of anatomy or stuff like this we have a better retention of what we're learning um if we are um operating some kind of procedure we have uh, the safety to make the mistakes in a controlled environment and learn from them which is something we can't always afford to do in a real life uh, scenario uh, we have an intuitive understanding of tasks that we might need to do uh, and we have a 
possibly a realistic or somewhat realistic environment, immersive environment for practice. Um, another thing would be uh, that we can improve the patient care, the care and diagnosis. So we have, you know, things like real-time guidance. We could have instructions on some kind of, um, you know, some, something we need to do in, in whatever job it is. This is actually extendable to many different types of job, not just uh, medical uh, for example, the idea of instructions would also be very useful in other sectors like industry. Um, and then I think something that is going to be a big one is the integration with AI, because obviously this is going it, to, it's, it's just going to completely integrate with uh, these two types of technology. Um, and then I guess we could say that there is an enhanced uh, productivity and efficiency, because you have, uh, uh, for example, real-time feedback for mistakes, for example, depending on what you're doing. Um, you could have no need for physical prototypes if you're, uh, I don't know, let's imagine that you're constructing um, a thermoplastic mesh for uh, a hand, so some kind of uh, brace or something for a hand. You could already plan this in 3D and actually see it rotate it in front of you, and you wouldn't need the physical prototype immediately and then you could then print it in a second moment um and yeah i think i'm i'm yeah obviously one big one is gamification and when you have a boring task in rehabilitation then the gamification process is fundamental and also in education this okay so gamification is the one that i often focus on in the things i build now that when it comes to a uh, diagnosis treatment or uh, rehabilitation of msk uh, issues so how is xr helping uh, when it comes to uh, decoding all of that okay so in terms of diagnosis i would say if we're talking about musculoskeletal issues and neurological issues i would say uh, this is not happening yet in terms of diagnosis uh, but we have the first ideas coming out. There's a bit of an ambulance in the background. Sorry about that. Um, so you're asking me about musculoskeletal issues. I would, first of all, maybe point out that the physical rehabilitation is a very large field. So we have respiratory, neurological pathology. And neurological pathology is probably one of the more indicated ones, more in a way than musculoskeletal for uh, virtual reality, uh, I would say. Uh, or mixed reality. So that w just to give an idea of anyone watching who isn't uh, familiar, that would be stroke, Parkinson's, uh, ataxia, which is a, like a balance problem with a problem to the cerebellum, uh, spinal lesions. Uh, so these are people who might be in a wheelchair or they might not even be able to have control of the upper part. Uh, multiple sclerosis. So these are, are uh, all uh, conditions that could be treated for example, with uh, with XR technology, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go past the diagnosis part because it's not really the area of uh, people who do rehabilitation, uh, or it if it is, it's more like a specific diagnosis of a functional diagnosis, if you will, and not a medical diagnosis, especially in Italy where where I am based. Uh, so that would be more something that a doctor would do. Um, however, uh, when you want to understand how uh, somebody is uh, moving or how somebody is walking you do what's called gait analysis and i'm sure that with integration with ai we could apply this very well with uh, vr um, so i think the more interesting part is maybe the treatment um, and uh, for physical rehabilitation um, i would say that uh, we and like i said you need to you need to be able to gamify the rehabilitation process you need to think that when these patients need to uh, perform an action, if they've had a stroke, for example, they need to repeat the movement many, many times because the problem is not in the muscle, it's in the part of the brain that controls the muscle, which may be may need in the first phase is to be used a lot, to be stimulated a lot, to be able to perhaps gain even just a small amount of movement. And to do this, we need a lot of repetitions. We need hundreds of repetitions. Now, if I tell somebody to go home, and take some peas out of a jar and put them on a plate or something, they will do this for five minutes, and then they will say, I don't want to do this anymore because it's boring, it's not fun, uh, I feel depressed doing it, right? Um, instead, if I'm getting them to play a game, they won't even realize how many movements they're doing, and we can 
elicit a certain type of movement that we want to bring them to perform uh, a, a task that is useful for their recovery. Um, also adds to this the pain management. Um, I think a good example of pain management in VR could be Soul Paint by a company called Hatsumi. Um, they got patients to paint their pain so they could kind of in some way express what they were feeling. Uh, this isn't so related to rehabilitation, but it's one, uh, I think, nice example of how, you know, pain can be expressed. But we also have the distractive uh, quality of pain management in VR, which is very strong. And this is kind of a little bit the focus of Softcare Studios as well, which is the one of the main companies that I work with. Um, and then uh, one last, uh, stop me if I'm going too much. <laughs> Uh, but one last uh, thing that I would uh, mention is uh, augmented reality, which is now uh, or also called mixed reality. I guess they're kind of the same thing when you're talking about um, a VR headset. Um, so uh, there's a company called Stroll, that's S-T-R-O, uh, three L's, I think. And what they do is they use uh, mixed reality for uh, Parkinson's disease, I believe, Um and the 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 useful thing about this is that you're providing cues. One of the th problems for people with Parkinson's disease is that they tend to freeze in doorways because they don't know. Uh, it, well, it's it's difficult to explain, but uh, in a short uh, uh, period. But basically, they get a condition called freezing. They have difficulty to walk uh, in indoor areas, for example. So one of the solutions is to have arrows painted on the ground, which are cues. And these help them to orient themselves in buildings. So you could have this done automatically in a mixed reality headset. And this is, I think, I believe this is what they are doing at Stroll. Uh, I just saw a couple of videos. I haven't spoken to them or anything, but uh, that's certainly something that, you know, I've thought about as well. And it's uh, a great idea. Uh, and lastly, I think we can uh, think about data, uh, you know, gathering data on patients when they're doing exercises at home, which is a big problem for us as clinicians, because we don't always know what the patient does at home. Uh, remote rehabilitation and education uh, about our own bodies, which could be done in VR. Uh, I've tried to, you know, put as much possible into this question as, as I could, but there, there would be a lot to say. We could do a whole series on this if you want. So as we are uh, talking about rehabilitation, so how does it, how XR makes it more engaging and also how can we like make it tailored to uh, individual patients' needs? Okay, so basically, um, obviously, there are lots of uses. Uh, it's difficult to explain this. Uh, you know, you have to consider that every patient has a different condition and every condition has many, many different ways of being existent. So uh, just to give you a few ideas, we could have somebody with phantom limb pain. So they are missing an arm and they feel pain in an arm that isn't there. This is an example of how we could use VR. We could have uh, shoulder rehabilitation. So I, I can only get up to here and then I have pain. And I need to go further. Uh, we could have reconditioning and cardiovascular exercise for somebody who is in a wheelchair. So they can't get out of their chair or they can't go places. And they they are missing this cardiovascular uh, exercise, which is has other reasons for existing, like prevention of you know diabetes and high blood pressure. So these are just a couple of examples that um, that I've given you now. Uh, there are many, many more. Um, so I guess consider that this is the the kind of the background, right? Um, I think the advantages are that it's highly customizable. So I can adjust the difficulty, the intensity, the height. I can exclude uh, one arm or the other. I can give you targets as I want. Uh, and I can do this with a tablet, for example, in the app I'm building externally. So I can say, Right, I don't want the patient to go above here. I can calibrate so that um, my patient will, when they feel pain, they, you know, they, I tell them only go and uh, reach your arm up to where you feel pain. The system records this level and will only go up to there in uh, providing targets, for example, for a reaching exercise. This is, I can exclude, you know, laterally um, the target to only arrive up to a certain level. I could increase the speed, so I can I can really do a lot. I can even, uh, for example, uh, tell the system not to make the person rotate their trunk like this. This is easier to show than to explain. 
uh, but only provide the target on the same side as the limb so that there is no trunk rotation. Or I could do the, the exact opposite if I want them to have this movement, which can be more difficult for balance, for example. Um, I can make it so that they are sitting down or standing up. So there are a lot of um, customizable options that can be adjusted over time and uh, you know give a progression, which is fundamental in rehabilitation. Um, and then we make it engaging and motivating. So this is the second point, which, as I explained before, is absolutely important. Uh, the gamification can uh, significantly increase the motivation and, and the adherence to the, the physiotherapy regimen. Um, and then we have real-time feedback and adjustment. Okay, this is quite important. And we could have uh, also in a cognitive um, rehabilitation associated with the physical rehabilitation. So in, often in stroke patients, we have uh, cognitive issues. So we can address these as well. We can give them a cognitive task as well as a physical uh, motor task. So we could have um, a, trainment, a training that is both for physical therapy, but is also uh, in, uh, you know, neurological cognitive functions. Uh, and this is something people all you know is which is already be, being done also in uh, traditional uh, flat screen um uh, serious gaming or you know therapy gaming therapy uh, stuff like this um and then as we've said improved pain management is another one um vr is particularly effective at this um mainly because it completely takes the uh patient or the person away from their surroundings and uh, it gives a you know it provides a strong stimulus to visual and auditory um, and even haptic feedback as well and this tends to kind of drown the pain in some way it tends to um, fill up our input uh, our uh, afferents so that we we have less uh, perception of the pain so it's it's kind of like a very powerful distract distraction but there's also the fact that we can transport people to peaceful uh, uh, surroundings. And this is another component of pain, right? More emotional component. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess these would be the main ones. Uh, I would also add data collection uh, for, you know, monitoring how people are, uh, how well people are doing and what progression they have. And we can have a very objective uh, monitoring of of data. Uh, we have to remember that the um, headset and the controllers provide us with, you know, movement data. So we could gather all this and see exactly how they move uh, in, in three dimensions. Um, and then I guess, lastly, social interaction. But this is like, again, more for the future, I would say. Let's also discuss a bit about physiotherapy as uh, it really plays a crucial role in uh, restoring and enhancing physical function of a patient. So uh, what do you think happens when XR is integrated into a physiotherapy practices? Well, I guess this we've kind of said this already. Um, but I think that the, the, the difference is that we are um, introducing a more active type of therapy, which is going to, you know, have the advantages we spoke about. Um, and I think that the focus will be more on the patient and less on the therapist uh, needing to, um, yeah, I guess that the, the, the focus will be more on the patient, basically, because it is they uh, who are performing in that moment. And I think this is important. And also, uh, how do you think it is going to enhance the uh, effectiveness of physiotherapy uh, practices? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I would probably go over the same list I told you before. Uh, so, you know, the fact it's highly customizable, uh, motivating, uh, we have real time feedback, we have, uh, an improve improvement of cognitive function. Uh, we have improved pain management, uh, safe and controlled environment so that we can control in some way. Um, we can simulate uh, you know, things that we would do in real life, like shopping or something. 
um, and we can build confidence in the patient, especially. So these these are the kind of things. And then, of course, remote rehabilitation and social interaction and data collection. These are the the benefits, let's say. Yeah. Uh, now that we have uh, talked about uh, the benefits that XR brings, now let's also touch upon what are the barriers and how can we address those barriers? Okay, so um, I think before we actually say the barriers to the adoption, if this is what you mean, uh, I would say that there is a risk to consider first. And this is not a barrier to adoption, but it's, a, it's the opposite. It's kind of a risk of if we adopt immediately XR without uh, thinking a little bit. Uh, I'm not somebody who says this should replace uh, traditional physiotherapy. In fact, I want to be very clear that this does not replace uh, many things in physiotherapy, except mainly for things that we would do anyway, but in a more boring way, okay? Uh, the reason is that um, there are many parts of physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is very complex, and there are many parts that we can't just reduce to an exercise played inside a, a, a headset. So this is a part of the therapy, uh, and we have to be careful of uh, you know entities or or organizations or more than anything companies that might try to reduce uh, the the quality of therapy in pursuit of tech innovation and cutting costs so this is a real risk and you know we have to be very careful of this people might say oh we can just put them in uh, virtual reality for an hour and the treatment is done no that's not how physiotherapy works um cost and accessibility uh is one of the barriers okay so obviously now not many people have a headset uh, it's not really a big problem for a company or for a hospital because they don't really cost much anymore and many headsets are, are fine. Uh, so it's more of a regulations thing at that point. Um, I guess you could say technical complexity and user friendliness might be a barrier. Again, um, we need good UI, accessible UI. So you need to have menus that the patient can touch. How will the menu, sorry, how will the patient interact with the menu if they cannot move their hand? These are all things that I'm addressing in my software. So a uh, type of user interface that is highly accessible and that doesn't require the patient to have many movements, except for maybe arm movement, OK? Um, also, it's also true that XR is probably more intuitive than um, other types of, of uh, technology, because I think a computer is almost more difficult. If I need to move a camera, in a computer game, I need to move the mouse and understand that the the mouse on a you know um, transversal plane translates to the camera in a three D uh, the camera rotation in a three D space, and this is much less intuitive than just moving my head and looking in the direction where I want to look. So XR is actually quite intuitive in terms of interaction, but we need to make the uh, user interface. Uh, apt for this we can't just expect to use the the usual uh logic that we would use with 2d applications um another barrier might be a comfort i would say that's a big one uh and maybe hardware limitations so you know the battery lasts too short uh for, for too not long enough the controllers need to be wearable and comfortable for people with any condition with their hand we might need to integrate hand tracking so that they can do exercises without the need for controllers if they can't wear them um and also they might be heavy so you know hand tracking might be better um we need the strap to be extremely comfortable we need the ipd to be highly adjustable so this would be the uh, as i'm sure you know the interpupillary distance uh, so the distance between the the eyes because that can cause us you know strain and uh, weight distribution needs to be on point as well. So it needs to be light, possibly, but mainly it needs to be distributed so that we don't have too much weight in front. Um, a thing that would be great in the future would be very focal lenses so that when we focus on an object, uh, you know, the, the rest blurs out. This would give us a more natural feeling. Um, another a few barriers that i see to adoption would be privacy and data security 
This is a whole chapter that I'm not going to open up now, but this is a concern that can be very specific to immersive tech um, alongside, you know, the usual problems of data privacy. Uh, for more info on this specifically, the organization that I'm a part of, which is xrsi.org, uh, deals specifically with this. And I'm a very small part of this. There are people who are way more uh, influential uh, and have a you know a very good understanding of this at, at very high levels. Um, so you know this is a good place to to look into that. Um, yeah, uh, another thing is that clinicians need to be trained on the use of VR in patients. So uh, we can't just expect a doctor who's never used VR to use this well. Uh, people need to really have a deep understanding of the hardware how to adjust it, uh, the fact that you uh, you have to introduce the patient to VR in a certain way. So we need to understand it really well if we're treating patients. And we need to know what types of experience when we develop software will cause cyber sickness and which ones are safer generally. Um, and there are you know, lots of things that you can do to limit uh, cyber sickness. Um, uh, and then we have you know, lack of guidelines. So this is something that will probably... Uh, increase in the future and I think uh, another one lastly is the limited awareness and skepticism uh, regarding uh, VR so I think a lot of people a lot of clinicians uh, are very suspicious of new technologies because they don't you know in, until something has evidence they're not convinced anyway and even when something has evidence uh, you know mm, it's new it hasn't been used we're not used to it it's maybe it will take my time there's many reasons why they don't want to adopt it. Uh, so I think we need to have educational initiatives, demonstrations, talk about it a lot, and showcase the effectiveness. For my part, with my patients, I use it now in uh, the clinic uh, here in Torino. It's not a private clinic. It's uh, an organization, and they take care of you know public health patients. So it's being used in just in a few places in Italy in public health care. And uh, I find it extremely effective, not for everyone, just when I think it's useful, I will use it. Um, but the patients are very happy with the effects of it. So, you know, I find it promising. Obviously, it would be nice to have more evidence on this and know, and, you know, and better guidelines and everything. Uh, but yeah. So lastly, uh, let's also uh, just uh, talk about what is the future outlook and uh... According to you, what are going to be the potential advancements? Okay, so um, I think uh, there's lots of possible things, probably things that we don't even know uh, will exist. But as I said, one I think is very focal lenses. This would be would really take us to another level um, because we would have a, a you know a much greater illusion that we are actually there. Then I would say advanced haptic feedback so that we can uh, have more sophisticated feedback that gives us uh, realistic sensations of, you know, touching objects. But I think that's a, uh, it might be a hard one to, to integrate. Uh, and then I think AI is going to be the next big thing that is going to completely integrate with XR and just change, not just XR, but everything we do in, in a very drastic way. It's already happening, so you know um, this could be useful for analyzing, uh, you know, motion patterns in patients and understanding uh, both for diagnosis. I'm thinking maybe you know Parkinson's disease. I think I believe they have done some studies where they have seen that you can tell if somebody has uh, Parkinson's disease at very early stages just by the way they move. So this is one possibility, but also just in general assessing somebody's movement. Uh, and with this also improving motion tracking and biomechanical analysis for, you know, uh, understanding uh, patient's progress and, and gait patterns. Um, and then um, I think remote training and tele-rehab. So this would be physiotherapy done remotely from home. Uh, this isn't something I've done this. We, we did a study on... on um, tele-rehabilitation uh, and it has some it's really good for certain things but it does tend to 
create a distance between the operator and the patient. So I have some reservations towards it. I think it can be extremely useful for when the patient is not actually in a physiotherapy cycle, but they are they finish their physiotherapy and they go home. And that's when usually we have the problems because they are not doing physiotherapy. They go home, they don't move. Uh, typical with you know elderly people, they go home, they don't move. And then two months later, they come back worse than before because they've gone home. They didn't do any exercises. Instead, if they have something to do and they have a follow-up, uh, you know, once every now and then with a with a therapist, this would be, I think, very good. And the health uh, care, uh, the public health care, would save a lot of money because they would have less requests for, you know, treatment. Um, and then I think streaming XR content from the cloud is a is an interesting one because this would mean that the headset doesn't need a GPU or a CPU, which is so powerful, so they can become lighter uh, and more comfortable. And, you know, but I think that's going to be a little bit far on in the future. Um, BCI, which is brain Comput computer interface, is another one that I think is, is likely to be uh, interesting to integrate with uh, virtual reality. More than anything for maybe communicating uh, for patients who can't talk and stuff like this. Yeah, I think... Uh, Oh, maybe community building and social social VR. That's uh, that could be interesting because you could have collaboration and community between patients in a virtual uh, world, and you know they this kind of sharing uh, of a situation is is I think powerful for the patients more than uh, an actual therapy. And I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think we can wrap it up here. So, uh, uh, thank you for joining us here. Uh, we got a lot of new perspective and new insights into how XR is uh, helping healthcare. So, thank again, you. thank you for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Namaskaram. Namaskaram.